when six actors playing one man over a period of over 50 years and 24 films with lots of competition that spans across many genres that cross over, how has James Bond survived as a film series? Is it because the actors played the role of Bond? Or what they did in the role helped them survive over time? Or is it the ways things worked out in Hollywood with its competition to make the success it is today? Is it because the series is able to adapt itself to current culture and make stories out of what is happening in the world, at such as the time adapting Casino Royale to fit a modern day setting that is post 9-11 and has nothing to do with the Cold War? Is the Bond series also able to adapt its way around the competition, mainly in America, and keep up in the cinema today with the vast amounts of high quality films being produced, in all especially but the action and spy genres? Also the vast competition from cross-genre films with science fiction and action such as Star Wars franchise has done. In order to find out how the Bond series has survived over the years, we will start at the beginning with the creator Ian Fleming, and how the Bond series was created from a book series that was brought to a film adaptation. We'll be looking at the actors that have played the great and iconic role of James Bond, and the troubles that the producers have had in changing the actor when they needed to and also the competition running alongside the Bond series, with action films rising in popularity from the early 70s. Also the complications of having to change actor, and to pick the perfect person to replace the previous lead role. How when the restrictions were lowered on the amount of violence, drugs and sexual references were introduced into film, and how this act had affected the series due to its competition becoming more violent and drug orientated through the 70s and 80s. We will see what each actor has brought to the series through his interpretation as Bond and what kind of competition the producers were facing from Hollywood at the time. How films like Star Wars made an impact on the series, forcing the producers to change and how it had to cope with the changes to make Bond survive. started in 1962 with Dr. No and Sean Connery playing the lead role. Mr. Bond. James Bond. Mr. Bond, I suppose you wouldn't care to um, raise the limit? I have no objections. James Bond was introduced to us by Ian Fleming in the 1953 novel Casino Royale. He based the Bond stories on some of the events of his life during World War II. He got the name from an unlikely place. When I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. Jacinta Johnson. My friends call me Jinx. My friends call me James Bond. Oh, I'm just here for the birds. Hmm. Ornithologist. Ah, uh, ornithologist, huh? Wow. Now, there's a mouthful. So you're going to be busy tonight with the owls, then, huh? No owls in Los Organos. Nothing to see till the morning. Not out there, anyway. He travelled the world in luxury with the most generous expense account ever granted to a British servant. He was witty, charming, fearless and incorruptible. In one of the rare masterstrokes of casting, Sean Connery personified James Bond with such perfection that even Ian Fleming, who was initially critical of Connery, admitted that it was difficult imagining anyone else in the part. Connery's performance in Doctor No did much to define Bond's persona. Having been the first man to play Bond in the official Eon movies, Sean Connery was an inspiration to the other actors who played the character. 
Sean Connery didn't only inspire the other actors that came after him, but he inspired most of the spy fans who always wanted to be like Bond, and the way he acts, having money, girls and guns and gadgets. Connery would also inspire screenplay writers that would write spy films based on the James Bond series that would eventually get made into a series of films. Doctor No was a very special film that introduced people to a whole new world of filmmaking. The magnificent high-tech sets, unique main title sequences and editing style would all become hallmarks of the series and influence an entire action film genre for decades to come. The film series did not start with humble beginnings. Although Ian Fleming's novels have become literary sensations by 1961, Producers Cubby Broccoli and Harry Salzman found major studios less than enthusiastic about bringing Mr. Bond to the screen. Most common objects is the fact that the subject was too British and too blatantly sexual. Eventually, United Artists gave them a budget of $1 million for what they hoped to be a moderately successful series of thrillers. The rest, they say, is history. Dr. No was a surprise hit of 1962. Never before had audience met an anti-hero quite like James Bond. Dr. No was so successful that in between 1962 and 1963 season, it grossed $60 million worldwide. This then meant that From Russia With Love and Goldfinger had bigger budgets. Many people still consider them to be the best films out of the series. With From Russia With Love giving us the now infamous pre-title credit sequence, Sean Connery is considered to be one of the better Bonds due to the fact he would act as Bond would. In the original source material. The best scene that Sean Connery shows emotion out of the six films he did was the laser scene in Goldfinger, released in 1964, one of the most iconic scenes throughout the whole Bond series. The laser effect was achieved by having someone hide under the table with a blowtorch and cut through the metal from below, which the laser beam was then added optically. No wonder that Sean Connery's fear looked so realistic. This emotion shows this exactly put together scene, it's brilliant and shows the emotion of Connery as Bond, and himself, as there is someone under the table with a blowtorch cutting through the metal, heading towards him. Choose your next witticism carefully Mr Bond, it may be your last. The purpose of our two previous encounters is now very clear to me. I do not intend to be distracted by another. Good night Mr Bond. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. It's hard to think that United Artists, the same studio which originally was reluctant to spend $1 million on Dr. No, had given $5.6 million for the budget of Thunderball. Times had changed, however. Bond was a leading pop culture icon. When photography began for Thunderball, 007 films had already spawned legions of imitators both on television and the big screens. The producers knew they had to demonstrate that a genuine Bond movie had scope and spectacle, which could never be replicated by the impersonators. With a budget of $9.5 million, the cost of bringing You Only Live Twice to completion, $3 million more than Thunderball, the reasons are very apparent. The premise was to ensure that every penny was reflected on screen, to make it look like an epic film. After You Only Live Twice had finished filming, Sean Connery told a columnist that he's done. Bond has been good to me. I've done my bit. I'm out. From October 1962 to May 1967, a period only four and a half years, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman premiered five James Bond films, which were met with unprecedented box office success and cheered by legions of fans across the globe. They had brought the world a new kind of hero. They had altered the language and business of the film industry and had created a pop culture phenomenon. During this time, James Bond had become both a symbol of cinematic innovation and hallowed tradition.